You know, a good joke is hard to find. I've heard some decent ones this time. I was getting picked up at the airport by Brother Mark, and he asked me if I was a Tennessee fan. He was kind of disappointed when I told him I was, and he said, because I had a good joke for you. He said, why do Tennessee ball players eat cereal out of a box? And I said, I don't know. I don't know why do they eat their cereal straight out of a box. He said, well, because they choke every time they get close to a bowl. And, you know, I thought that was, <laughs> thought that was a pretty good joke. I... I heard one several years ago. There's a young man who got a huge inheritance, and he'd always wanted a Ferrari Testarossa, one of those that didn't have, you know, a, a, just a candy apple red, super fast, convertible, just highest end vehicle that you could get. It was worth about 500 grand, and he got a huge inheritance of millions of dollars, and so he decided he was going to buy himself a Ferrari Testarossa, convertible, candy apple red, and he was going to drive it through his town, make sure everybody knew how successful he now was. And so he did that. He, it was a pretty day. It was sunny. He had his top down there, and he was driving through town. If the light was yellow, he made sure he needed to stop so everybody could see him. Well, he pulls up next to this, looks like a guy who's about 85 years old, and he's on a moped. Well, you know a moped. It's not even a real motorbike. It's just kind of almost like a, a gas scooter and it'll go top speed about 45 miles an hour and this older gentleman's got his little helmet on he's sitting there on his moped and he looks over at this young guy in this candy apple red Ferrari Testarossa and he leans over there to the stoplight and he says Sonny that's some kind of car he said how long have you had it and the young guy said well I appreciate it thank you I've, I've had it for one week he said wow one week he said if you don't mind me asking he said what's a car like this cost and the young guy said, well, don't mind you asking it all. It cost me $500,000. Well, old man almost had a heart attack. Paul almost fell off his moped. He said, $500,000? He said, that's crazy. He said, what in the world would make this car worth $500,000? Young guy said, well, you can lean over and look at it. So the old man leans over, and it's, of course, got the top down. He leans over, looks at all the bells and whistles and everything. And he says, still, I, don't understand. I just don't understand why you'd pay $500,000 for a vehicle, even with all this stuff in it. The young guy said, well, let me tell you, it'll go zero to 200 miles per hour in six seconds. The old man said, no. He said, I ain't never seen a car that'll go zero to 200 miles an hour in six seconds. That's ridiculous. No way that's going to happen. Well, right when he said that, the light turned green, and so the young guy decided he was going to show him that it would go zero to 200 miles an hour in six seconds. So he floors it, just white smokes. I mean, talking burn the tires, white smokes, and takes off. He's going about oh, 75 miles an hour at about 1.2 seconds, and he looks back and he sees something in his rearview mirror. Well, about three seconds into it, he's going about 100 miles an hour, and he watches as the old guy on the moped <laughs> blows by him. He's thinking, what in the world is happening? He watches the old guy turn around and <laughs> blow back by him. Well, now it's six seconds into it. He's going 200 miles an hour. He looks in his rearview mirror, and here comes the old guy on the moped, <laughs> bam, and plants into his bumper. He's thinking, what in the world has just happened? So he's kind of had a wreck here. The guy planted in his bumper and gets out. Well, well thankfully, the guy is, is not hurt, and he goes back. And he says, are you okay? The old guy says, yeah, yeah, I'm all right. So I just bruised up a little bit, I think. And he said, is there anything I can do for you? He said, yeah, yeah, if you don't mind... If you could unhook my suspenders from your rear view mirror, that would be real helpful. <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes stuff gets attached to something, and, and you know, you, you just have trouble getting it unattached. Well, we're looking this morning at the idea of the consequences of a belief system. You get to choose your actions. You don't get to choose the consequences. You get to choose your beliefs, but you don't get to choose the implications of your belief. Now, what I mean by the implications of your belief, it goes something like this. In the book of Revelation, the Bible talks about how in heaven there is going to be a gate that is never going to be closed by day, and there is no night there. Now, if you believe that there's a gate in heaven that's never going to be closed by day and there is no night there, then you have taken on an implication that is just as sure as your belief. And that's simply this. That if the gate is never closed by day and there's no night, then what does that imply? The gate's never closed. 
Now, you can say, well, I didn't believe that the gate is never closed. I just believe the gate's not closed by day and there's no night. But when you accept those beliefs, you accept the implications and the consequences of those beliefs. And so we're looking at the ideas of the existence of God and of atheism, the disbelief in God. We have proven up to this point that there is a God and that all of the available evidence shows us if you are honest, you have to conclude that there's a God. Now, if you don't conclude that there's a God, if you say, I do not believe in God, then that means there are going to be some implications that you might not like, you might not agree with, but they are attached to the idea that there is no God. And I'm going to show you some of those implications this morning. Several years ago, in the late 1880s, a man by the name of George Walser decided that he was going to start a township. It was about 1880 or so, and he named this township Liberal, Missouri. And here were the qualifications for you to live in this township. In order to live in Liberal, Missouri, you could not believe in God, not believe in heaven, not believe in hell, not believe in Satan or any other spiritual entity. You had to be an atheistic naturalist. You had to believe that this world was all that there was and all that there is and that there's no supernatural of any kind. Now here was his idea. If we just got people who don't believe in God and they focus all of their energy on the physical, then it will be a much better society than if they waste their energy on spiritual pursuits and religion. And so that's what he did. He said, liberal Missouri, you have to not believe in God. And he thought it was going to be the greatest community that had ever been devised. In fact, that was what he suggested, and that was what he was trying to prove. It was really a social experiment. I'm going to prove to you that if you get a bunch of atheists together who don't believe in God, it's going to be the best possible place that there is. Well, was it? A man by the name of Clark Braden, if I understand it, who was a member of the church, he traveled around and debated and preached and did meetings, etc., he went through liberal Missouri in the 1880s and reported in a St. Louis Post-Dispatch what he saw in liberal Missouri. And here's what he said. He said, the place is a cesspool of immorality. He says, everybody cusses, including the youngest children and all the women. He said, the brothels that people called hotels are places of rampant prostitution. He said most everybody drinks and gets drunk on a regular basis, and the majority of the people wish they could get out of liberal, but the property value has gone down so badly that they can't sell their homes and they're stuck. And so you can today go and see liberal Missouri, and I would show up. Oh, wait just a second. Well, hold on. Let's turn this on. See what happens. You know, sometimes that on button is very valuable. <laughs> Liberal Missouri. You can go see it today. It's still there. Population 779. I'm always kind of humored by the population signs in any place because was that the population yesterday? I mean, did they have any kids today? But, you know, population 779, here's Walser Avenue. George Walser, who, in, who founded the township. Here's Darwin Drive. Named after Charles Darwin, obviously, because he was naming the streets after unbelievers and, and famous naturalists and people who didn't believe in God. If you were to see this particular sign right here, that'd be Payne Avenue. This is Ingersoll Drive, named for the agnostic Robert Ingersoll. You can still go. Interestingly, interestingly now, though, there are about 23 different churches in liberal Missouri, population 7079, and here's what happened. St. Louis Post-Dispatch, here's the article, an infidel experiment that Clark Braden wrote. One of the owners of the hotels that he called a brothel sued Clark Braden for $25,000 for libel and slander and said, you can't say that stuff about our town. Well, apparently, it was so true and obvious and it was so not stretching any of the evidence that the case was thrown out of court Clark Braden never had to appear to defend himself at all, and the person who was suing him had to pay all of the court costs because he was right. That's exactly what was going on. 
in liberal Missouri. And so this experiment to prove to us that atheism is a superior moral system failed miserably. Now, I think you're going to see exactly why this would fail as we go through the implications of atheism. But here's what's interesting. George Walter, the man that founded Liberal Missouri, several years later came in contact with the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now, when you go into Liberal Missouri, the, the cemetery is arranged in one of the oddest formations I've ever seen. In fact, it's a complete circle, the cemetery is, where all of the graves are pointing in to a central grave where, Clark, where George Walser was going to be buried. He wanted himself buried right in the middle of all of his fellow unbelievers and atheists. Well, several years after that, when he came in contact with the teachings of Jesus Christ, he realized, hold on just a second, I don't want to be buried in the middle of all of those unbelievers, and his tombstone is about 45 minutes away in Lamar, Missouri, and in the end of his life, as you were looking at a poet, lawyer, and philanthropist who dies in 1910, he came in contact with the teachings of Jesus Christ and changed his whole way of thinking. I would suggest that one of the reasons for that was that he saw what happens when a bunch of unbelievers get together and behave in a way that corresponds to their unbelief. Now, let's look at this statement. This is from, before we read it, I want you to see this from Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell wrote an essay titled Ideas That Have Helped Mankind, but he also wrote an essay titled Why I'm Not a Christian. Bertrand Russell was not a Christian, had no uh, friendship toward Christianity, wouldn't want to help anyone believe in Christianity, wanted people who believe in Christianity to know that that was false and that it wasn't a good idea, etc. But he did write this article titled Ideas That Have Helped Society. And here's what he says. Christianity, as soon as it conquered the state, put an end to the gladiatorial shows. Not because they were cruel, but because they were idolatrous. The result, however, was to diminish the widespread education and cruelty by which the Roman populace were degraded. Christianity also did much to soften the lot of slaves. It established charity on a large scale. It inaugurated hospitals. Established charity on a large scale, inaugurated hospitals. Although the great majority of Christians failed lamentably in Christian charity, the ideal remained alive and in every age inspired some notable saints. In a new form, it passed over modern liberalism. Now catch this. And remains the inspiration of much that is most hopeful in our somber world. Now, if you were to ask Bertrand Russell, are you a Christian? No. Do you believe Christianity is true? No. Do you believe Jesus Christ is God's son? No. What happens when a society accepts the ideas of Jesus Christ? Well, you stop killing people for fun in the gladiatorial shows. You inaugurate charity on a large scale. You then build hospitals to help sick people. And Christianity remains the inspiration behind much that is most hopeful in our somber world. Now, let's ask a question. Would you like to live in a place where people act like Christ taught them to live? Would you like to live in a place where people did to others what they would want done to them? It would be pretty exciting, wouldn't it? Would you like to live in a place where each person looked out not only for his own interest, but also the interest of others, and nothing was done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, everyone esteemed others as well or better than himself? Wouldn't that be an exciting place? Would you want to live in a place where people were kind, tender-hearted, loving as brothers, forgiving because Jesus Christ forgave them? Can you imagine if just a congregation of the Lord's people, everybody decided in that congregation, this year we are going to live exactly to the best of our ability like Jesus Christ asked us to live. We're going to respect each other. We're going to treat each other like we want to be treated. We are going to put others' needs before our own. Wouldn't that be an exciting place to live? Absolutely, positively. And for all the unbelief that Bertrand Russell has, here's what he said. Yeah, okay, a lot of the Christians failed to do it, 
But when people do live like Jesus taught them to, the best place in the world. And that's a fact. It is the best place in the world when people live like Christ taught them to. Now, it's at this point that the skeptic often comes in and says, well, hold on just a second. You know, what about the Salem witch trials? What about the Crusades? The Crusades were done in the name of Christ. Salem witch trials were done in the name of Christ. Isn't that a representation of what happens when you put Christianity into action? No, absolutely, positively not, and here's why. Just because someone calls themselves a Christian does not mean that they are living like a Christian. Now, the Crusaders went over and killed people in the name of Christ, contending that that's what Jesus taught them to do. But if you look at the life of Jesus, you'll understand that that's not what he taught at all. In fact, when he was standing before Pilate, Pilate said, are you a king? And Jesus said, you rightly say that I am. But he said, my kingdom is not of this world, because if my kingdom were of this world, then my people would, would fight physically. But he said, that's not where my kingdom is, and so that's not how my people do. You see, the people who were perpetuating the sinful actions of the Crusades and Salem witch trials weren't living out the logical implications of Christianity. They were claiming to be Christians, but they were living like something else. Now, we see that all the time, don't we? We see people who will claim to be Christians, and they will live immoral, sexually promiscuous lives. We see people who claim to be Christians, and they will cuss on a regular basis and steal and do various different things. Just because someone says they believe something doesn't mean they accurately represent what they claim to believe. Now, what we're going to see is that's very important, because just because someone says they are unbelievers and they don't believe in God, lots of times they actually live in many ways like they do. So what you're going to see is a lot of people don't live out the implications of their beliefs. And the witch trials and the crusades are certainly not a progression of the teachings of Jesus Christ. They're a perversion of the ideas of Christianity. Now, as we go, we need to then ask the simple question, can atheism answer moral questions? I mean, if you were to go to someone who doesn't believe in God and say, can you tell me something is absolutely morally right or absolutely morally wrong? The challenge there is simply that they admit atheism can't do that. In fact, William Provine, he was a Ph.D. biologist there at Cornell University. He was speaking on Darwin Day, 1998, and here's what he said. Naturalistic evolution has clear consequences. Now, do you remember what I said earlier in this lesson? That there are implications of beliefs that whether you like them or not, if you have certain beliefs, you have to then admit those implications. Now, here's what Provine's saying. There are consequences of believing in evolution that whether you like it or not, you've got to admit they're true logically. And here's what he says. No gods worth having exist. No life after death exists. No ultimate foundation for ethics exists. No meaning in life exists and human free will is non-existent. He said, if you believe that you are a an accident that is here over blind random chance processes over multiplied millions of years. You might like to think that there's some meaning in your life, but the consequence is there's not. You might like to think that you can say this is morally right, this is morally wrong, but the reality is you can't. You might like to think that you're actually making your own decisions and that there's human free will, but if matter is all that there is, then you're not really doing that. It's just the cells and the atoms banging around in your head. Those are the consequences. But one of those consequences is the lack of a foundation for ethics. Okay, here's the question we're asking me. If there's no God, how do you decide if somebody's doing something that's morally right or morally wrong? Where's the standard? Well, William Provine and the rest of the atheists who will admit the truth of their belief recognize what well, we can't say. It's morally right and morally wrong. And I'll give you some examples of this. Charles Darwin says, a man who has no assured and ever-present belief in the existence of a personal God or future existence of retribution and reward, if he doesn't believe in heaven and hell and he doesn't believe in God, he can have for his rule of life, as far as I can see, only to follow those impulses and instincts which are the strongest or which seem to him the best ones. Understand that? He says, you know, if you don't believe in God and you don't think there's a heaven, you don't think there's a hell. You don't think there's any ultimate justice or retribution. 
how do you decide what you want to do and what you think is right? He said, well, you just follow your instinct, the ones that seem the best to you. Okay, so you're at the local steak joint, and you order a 20-ounce uh, porterhouse T-bone, and the guy next to you orders like a 10-ounce ribeye. You get your steak, and it looks like it's about an 8 ounce. It's the most pitiful little piece of meat you've ever seen. This guy over here ordered the 8 ounce, and he's got a massive piece of, it just looks delicious and huge, and you're really hungry, and this guy's a lot skinnier and littler than you are, and you want his steak, and you don't want to eat yours. And it just seems to you, right, that because you're bigger and you need more food than he does, you should get it. And so you walk over to him and say, hey, buddy, give me your steak. And he said, I'm not giving you my steak. You said, well, I ordered the bigger one. You ordered the smaller one. And you somehow got one bigger than me. That's not fair. I want your steak. He says, you're not getting my steak. Now, let's say deep down in you there's an urge that says, this isn't right. You're bigger than him. You should eat more food than he does. In fact, you ordered more food. You should, and you are bigger and big enough to take this from him, and you punch him in the face and take his steak. According to naturalistic evolution, have you done something wrong? Well, they might say, you know, that's not beneficial to society. If everybody did that, what would happen? That's not the best way to make friends. Later on, if you need to buy something from this guy, he probably won't give you a good deal. They will go through all kinds of thinking about how that might not help you. But if you cut to the heart of the matter and say, no, 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 I'm not talking about that. Is it wrong? You know what they have to say? Yeah. Was that the impulse or the instinct that was the strongest to you? Well, then... You didn't do anything wrong. Now, you can see why a place like liberal Missouri would start to degrade into a moral cesspool because if everybody just decides, hey, if this seems right to me, I'll just do it. Well, I think you probably heard a very wise person state one time, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is the way of death, isn't it? And that's exactly what Charles Darwin was saying. If you don't believe there's a God, well, hey, just do what feels right. And what feels right sometimes is absolutely morally wrong, but atheism can't answer moral questions. Dan Barker said there's no actions in and of themselves that are always absolutely right or wrong. It depends on the context. You can't name an action that's always absolutely right or wrong. I can think of an exception in every case. Now, this got pretty serious when one of the students said, well, could you ever think of an example when rape would be right, morally acceptable and right? And he came up with this situation in which he said, yes, it would be the morally right thing to do in this situation if you did that. Now, what I naively thought was that when unbelievers heard Dan Barker say, yes, this would be the morally right thing to do, that they would distance themselves as far away from him as they could because they would see for themselves the implications of atheism. But they didn't because atheism doesn't allow you to make moral decisions. It cannot say something is absolutely right or wrong. I'll give you another example. We've got a uh, down in Montgomery years and years ago, there was a guy who had called his wife. She asked him to pick up some bread and milk on the way home. There were two guys that liked his truck and they followed him to Walmart. He went in, bought bread and milk, came out and he was about to get in his truck. The two guys were waiting for him. It was a Ford F-150. They pulled a pistol on, shot him, killed him, stole the truck. Now, did they do something wrong? You see, as you ask that question, what you realize is, from an evolutionary atheistic standpoint, you would have to approach it like, well, maybe they were more fit than he was or smarter than he was, and maybe they were eliminating a less fit individual from the gene pool, and so later on that might help humans evolve to a higher level, and you can't really say it was wrong because... Man, all kinds of stuff, but when you ask a question, is it wrong? Do you understand that only a belief in God allows you to answer that question in any real sense of the term? Yes, it's morally wrong. Why? Because it's against the nature of God. No, it's morally right. Why? Because it's in accordance with the nature of God. It's the only way you can do it. You get God out of the picture, and you have just jettisoned every standard for morality. Now, you don't have to take my word for that. I didn't make that up. I didn't say it. Who did William Probine and Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins and the rest of the atheists who admit the consequences of their belief? Now, I'm going to show you how this works. You probably understand that in the United States of America, right now, we are killing one million unborn children every single year. In our kids magazine, Discovery, we wrote about abortion, the murder of unborn children. 
had a nine-year-old read that. We, we put it in a way we felt like would be understandable to our younger audience. It's third through sixth grade is who our audience for Discovery is. And we just explained that this is something that is immoral because God values all human life. And this nine-year-old read it and was shocked that that actually goes on in our country. Couldn't believe it. And went to his dad. He said, Dad, do you, do you know that this happens in our country, that, that people legally kill unborn babies? And he said, yeah, it, it does. I, I, I know it happens. We've tried to, to talk and say things against this. We've tried to write against it. We've prayed hard, but we just hadn't got anything done. It still happens. A million babies a year to the tune of 55 million babies. We've killed an entire generation of United States citizens in the last 40 years. We got 330 million people in the United States at the present. We've killed 53 million in the last 40 years. So you start, we've killed more than 10% of our population because of some mistaken idea that humanity doesn't start until a child is born, which is ridiculous. I'm going to show you that even atheists know that's a ridiculous idea. Well, this young guy, this nine-year-old said, well, we've got to do something about that. And so he wrote a letter to his senator, I think, for that particular state. And he said, hey, did you know this is happening? We need to make some laws about this. We need to get people to help us. And that letter somehow got picked up by the newspaper editor and he put it in the newspaper and he put it in its entirety and he said, isn't it refreshing that some people are still asking the right questions about this, what's happening in our country? Well, you know, we've been in the country and we get kind of calloused about it and we throw sometimes this idea into, well, that's a political issue. No, 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 it's not a political issue. It's, it's a moral issue. It's an issue that has to do with the lives of innocent children. Now, here's the question. If you take Christianity, you take atheism, which of the two would allow the United States to feel like they are morally justified in killing a million babies a year? You know, when the Twin Towers fell, that single act of terrorism killed about 2,500 2, people that day. You know how many babies we killed that day? About 2,500. You know how many babies we killed the day before that? 2,500. You know how many babies we killed the day after that? 2,500. We've been killing 2,500 babies a day, every day, since 1973, on average, and some days more. Now, when that was per perpetrated on our soil, we were furious. I mean, George Bush, you remember George Bush came on, and he said, we're going to hunt the terrorists down who did this, and we're going to bring them to justice, and if there's a country that's harboring them, we're going to bring that country to justice. And so where was the speech about bringing all the people who are killing unborn children to justice. You know, it just was absent because we've just gotten complacent about this. Well, where could you go to get the idea that it would be all right to kill unborn children? Well, there's a good reason you could go to atheism. I show you that's the truth. Darwin said there's no fundamental difference between man and the higher mammals and their mental faculties. Now, think with me. Here is a logical implication of naturalistic evolution. If you think that humans are just another animal on the scale, then listen to what our founders said. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among those rights are the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, if you get rid of the creator, if you think that you weren't created, then where do you get the right as a human to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Well, you, you don't get it. In fact, when you get rid of God, you get rid of human rights because the reason that you view humans different than animals is because humans have been made in the image of God. Animals have not. But when you just put humans in line with all of the rest of the animals, then they basically have all the same rights as the animals. And they might have a little more because they might be more beneficial official to society or something like that, but not because they're any different. They're just a, a higher level, a different scale, but not a different kind. Well, let me continue to show you. Barbara Burke, 1974, in an article titled Infanticide, here's what she said. Among some animal species, infant killing appears to be a natural practice. Could it be natural for humans to trade inherited from our primate ancestors? Charles Darwin noted in The Descent of Man that infanticide has been probably the most important of all checks on population growth throughout most of human history. She said, look, you watch animals, they kill their babies. My dad, years ago, had a coon dog that had a pedigree as long as your arm. The dog was worth 
thousands of dollars, but somehow we got the dog for real cheap, and we didn't really know why. She had a litter of puppies. She had 10 puppies the first time. They were going to be worth about a thousand bucks a piece, we thought. She ate them all but one. <laughs> thought she could only raise one puppy. Next time, she had a litter of puppies. She had eight, I think, the next time. Ate them all but one. Thought she could only have one puppy. Barbara Burke says, look, you look at how animals do things. They kill their babies, don't have a qualm. One about it. Do you know why a Komodo dragon, an adult cannot climb trees and a baby Komodo dragon can? You know what 10% of the adult Komodo dragon diet is? Baby Komodo dragons. Yeah, they just eat their babies. In fact, the babies hatch out of eggs, and if they're anywhere around, the adult Komodo dragons, the adults just eat them. Now, Barbara Burke says, if you're just an animal, and adult Komodo dragons eat their babies... They kill them because they don't think there's enough room on the island for all the Komodo dragons that would be alive if they didn't eat them. Then if you're just another animal, what can you do? Morally, acceptably. You see, when you get rid of the idea of God, whether you like it or not, it's a moral implication of unbelief. It comes along. It's attached to the car. It gets drugged behind it. If you don't believe in God, whatever else you want to try to say, you just can't say that there are human rights. Because humans are no different than animals. Now, you know, if you were to look through the Bible, all through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, you would see something very different than that. In Genesis chapter 9, after the flood, God comes to Noah and he says, you can eat all the animals. But anybody that sheds man's blood, by him, he's going to be called on the carpet to justice for shedding man's blood because humans are created in the image and likeness of God. Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27. Now, if they're not created in the image and likeness of God, what happens to their value? Well, it goes out the window, and they're only as valuable as they are beneficial to society. Now, Peter Singer, who Richard Dawkins, the world's leading atheist, said is the most moral man that he knows. In a little YouTube video that I was watching, he said, if we compare a severely defective human infant with a non-human animal, dog or pig, we'll often find the non-human animal, the dog or the pig, to have superior capacities. Only the fact that the defective infant is a member of the species Homo sapiens. Now, now, stop right there. What's he saying? Only the fact that the infant is human has led us to treat it differently from the dog or pig. He says, look, have we treated humans different than dogs or pigs in the past? Sure you have. Why have you? Not because the human's going to be more valu valuable to society. In fact, you might have to expend all kinds of more resources on this human than you would a dog or pig. This dog might be a German Shepherd. It might be a highly qualified, great DNA dog that could be a police dog. This human might have incapacities that are going to cause it to be a burden on society. And for years we've said, if, if you've got to keep one of them, you've got to kill the dog, keep the human. Why? He said, well, because it's human. But then he says, species membership alone, however, is not morally relevant. Now, folks, let me tell you what this is. That what, what you need to understand is, this is not Kyle Butt making this up. I'm not telling you that this is what the atheists say. I'm showing you that the atheists are saying it themselves. Now, listen to what the atheistic ethicist, who Richard Dawkins, the world's leading atheist, says is the most moral person he knows is saying. Here's what he says. Hey, we've been keeping the human and killing the dog because the human is human, but we need to get rid of that idea that you just save something because of what species it's a member of. Just because it's human, you shouldn't be saving. See, you get rid of the idea of God, you get rid of the image of God, and you get rid of the values for humans. Whether you like that or not, if we can put aside the obsolete and erroneous notion of the sanctity of all, of all what kind of life? Human. Life. Then we can start looking at the human life as it really is. He said, man, we've been keeping humans alive because they're human, and that's just the wrong approach because if evolution is true and atheism is true, humans are just another animal. And the reason that you keep this animal and you don't keep this animal is this animal can help you, this animal can't. So you start making decisions about who can help you in society, and that's how you decide which ones you're going to keep. Peter Singer says, nevertheless, the main point is clear. Killing a disabled infant, it's not morally equivalent to killing a person. Very often, it's not wrong at all. You see the problem there. You don't get to adopt the idea of unbelief and atheism and godlessness without having the consequences of that belief 
come along with it. Now, you can live like you don't believe that. You can deny it if you want, but it's a logical consequence of unbelief. When you get rid of the idea of God, you get rid of the idea of human value. Now, there's a reason that when you go to Psalm 14, 1 through 3, you read, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But now, lots of times we stop right there and we don't read the rest of the text. The rest of the text says they are corrupt, they have done abominable things, there is none who does good, no, not one. Now, what is he saying in that text? That is a commentary on what happens when you put unbelief into actual life practice. When you get rid of the idea that there's no God and you put that into practice, they are corrupt, they have done abominable things, there is none who does good, no, not one. Now, you can claim atheism and live a moral life. You can claim Christianity and live an immoral life. But you can't claim atheism and put it into practice and live a moral life. And you can't claim Christianity and put it into practice and live an immoral life. Now continue with me. James Rachel says, there again, atheist. He was teaching at the University of Alabama, if I understand correctly. He wrote a book titled Created from Animals, The Moral Implications of Darwinism. He said an infant with severe brain damage, I mean, even if it survives for many years, it may never learn to speak, its mental powers may never rise above a primitive level. In fact, its psychological capacities, they may be markedly different, inferior to those of a typical rhesus monkey. In that case, moral individualism, atheism is what he's talking about, would see no reason to prefer its life over the monkey's. Now, why would you, as a Christian, keep a human alive when you might have to do serious work and pour in serious resources into the life of that human? There's one reason. Because humans are made in the image of God. And there is value in every human, and it doesn't matter how fast you can run. doesn't matter how handsome or pretty you are doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter if you are ever going to invent a new thing or to find a cure for anything. You are valuable for a single reason. God made you in his image. You get rid of the idea that God made you in his image and you start to see, well, I mean, why would you keep a human alive over a rhesus monkey? And James Rachel goes even further, and here's what he says. Some unfortunate humans, because they've suffered brain damage, they're not rational agents. What are we to say about them? The natural conclusion, according to the doctrine we're considering, would be that their status is that of mere animals. And perhaps we should go on to conclude that they may be used as non-human animals are used, as laboratory subjects or as food. Now listen to me. Did you ever think you would read a statement from an unbeliever that admits the logical implication of our unbelief means you could treat humans as laboratory subjects? No. In fact, you would think that if and when they admit that, the rest of the people who seem to be good moral people in a lot of ways would look at that belief and say, no, I don't want any part of that. And yet, you have leading atheists who will admit this in a very frank way. And other unbelievers will say, yeah, yeah, but, and just roll right on. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable things. There is none who does good. No, not one. Listen to me. The reason that I so adamantly fight against atheism Number one, it's just wrong. But number two, the logical implications of atheism are devastating. And the more people in our society that adopt this very, very sinful and wrong understanding of reality, well, the worse and worse the social structure of our society will become. It's something that's very, very dangerous. It's not just, a, oh, hey, you believe this, I believe this. All right, we'll just agree to disagree. This is very, very serious. Continue with me. Dr. Eric Pianca, in 2006, he was the science teacher of the year in Texas. Now, you probably know something about Texas. Texas is so big that Texas determines how textbooks are written. 
I mean, they just basically, if Texas adopts it, then the rest of the country adopts it because Texas is monstrous. If you are the scientist of the year in the state of Texas, that is some kind of honor there. So he goes to give his acceptance speech. He talks to the guy who's doing the camera right before he gets up. The guy acts aggravated, but the guy, Eric Pionk, continues to talk to him, and he makes the guy not film his speech. So Pionk gets up, and in the course of it, he studies lizards and reptiles, etc. And here's what he says to the audience. He says, humans are a bane on our planet, and they are taking resources that belong to other organisms, and humans are no better than bacteria. I don't know why we have valued them over other animals like lizards and snakes and things. And here's what really needs to happen. We need to kill 90% of the humans on the planet to equalize things so other organisms can abound. And they ask him, how do you think we need to do that? He said, well, if we had a good strain of airborne Ebola virus that would just kill people in three or four days, that would be the way to do it. Okay, he's talking to 400 educators in Texas. He's receiving the Texas Scientist of the Year Award. What would you hope that the audience would do in response to that type of speech? Stand up, walk out. Somebody come up to the podium and correct his thinking. Somebody explain to him that humans are valuable and more valuable because they are different than animals and they're not just in the... That's what you hope. What'd they do? Stood up, gave him a standing ovation. When one of the educators who was there presented what he had said, lots of the people said, no, 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 he didn't really say that. Well, when you start looking at the students' responses, maybe, do I have it? Yeah. Here's one of the students' responses to Dr. Pianca's speech. Dr. Pianca's talk at the TSA meeting was mostly of the problems humans are causing as we rapidly proliferate around the globe. He's a radical thinker, thinker that one. I mean, he's basically advocating for the death of all but 10% of the current population. And at the risk of sounding just as radical, I think he's right. Incidentally, you think he'd volunteer to be in the 90%? You think he'd volunteer his grandkids to be in the 90%? You know what's interesting? That when they start devaluing humans, it's humans that are less capable than them, that have less mental capacities than them, that aren't as beneficial to society as they are. You see, Dr. Pianca is not saying, hey, let's kill the scientist of the year. He's saying, let's kill people who are inferior to me because really I'm one of the most fit. And atheism teaches that the most fit survive, doesn't it? I don't have time to finish this particular lesson. I would just like to simply say, I'm going to get to that here in a second. Hold on. This, okay, all right, forget, forget. Oh. Let me say this. When you start to compare the beliefs of Christianity with the implications and consequences of atheism, the fact of the matter is only one of those two could give you a society that is sustainable, that is loving and kind and forgiving and is considerate. Atheism has no foundation whatsoever to even value human life. And yet Christianity, when God made humans in his own image, he set a standard for the value of human life that can only be found in the singular statement, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Thank you very much for your time. Look forward to being with you in the worship hour. I'm going to get that right.